Okay, we're excited to introduce our keynote speakers. We have a joint keynote tonight, which is something that is not done often. Actually, there was a conference here in, from Performance Studies, I think, last week at NYU about joint uh, speeches and keynotes. Uh, so this is cool that we're sort of picking up on that theme. Um, and we have to just announce a, a sort of a change, which is that um, Deb Cohen will be joining us virtually. Um, and she is going to talk about her reasons for doing that um, as part of her talk in, in just a bit. And she's happy to talk with people via um, Google Hangout here on the computer afterward if anyone wants to talk with her then. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So we have um, our first keynote uh, of our joint keynote session tonight is Carolina Bank Munoz, who we're very excited to have here at MCC. Carolina Bank Munoz is professor of sociology at Brooklyn College and the CUNY Graduate Center. Her work focuses on immigration, globalization, labor, work, and Latin America. Her book, Transnational Tortillas, Race, Gender, and Shop Floor Politics in Mexico and the United States, is the winner of the Terry Book Award. She has recently published Building Power from Below, Chilean, Chilean Workers Take on Walmart, also with Cornell. And we are selling that book, uh, and you'll, you can get it after the keynote, um, sort of right by the door as you leave. Um, so please check it out. And we have Carolina live in person who will be signing the book as well. Uh, and in May 2018, her edited volume with Bridget Kenny and Antonio Stetcher, Walmart in the Global South, will come out with the University of Texas Press. And our uh, second keynote speaker is Deborah Cowan. Uh, Deborah is an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. Deeply committed to social justice and transformation, her work addresses the politics of infrastructure. She has written about the suburbanization of poverty, issues of race and space, urban securitization, and the reach of war into civilian spaces. Deb is the author of The Deadly Life of Logistics, Mapping Violence in Global Trade, which was awarded the 2016 International Political Sociology Book Award, Military uh, Workfare, The Soldier and Social Citizenship in Canada, and with Emily Gilbert, War, Citizenship, and Territory. So Carolina, we'll start. Great, so um, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm honored to be here, especially with uh, Deborah Callen via Toronto. Um, and it's, it's, I've learned so much today, so uh, thank you to all the presenters for such great panels. Um, so Walmart is the quintessential anti-union employer in the US, but we know less about Walmart's global operations. Surprisingly, in nearly all of its global retail operations, Walmart is unionized. So with the exception of Canada and the United States, everywhere else in retail, Walmart is unionized. Of course, being unionized alone doesn't mean that workers are doing well. Um, and we have to dig deeper to understand what kinds of organizations workers are building, how much power they have, and how democratic they are. Walmart Global is complicated in this respect. Many of its unions are company unions or corrupt unions, for example, in Mexico. By contrast, in Brazil, Walmart has had to comply with state policy and powerful sectoral unions. And in Chile and Argentina, workers have been at the forefront of building democratic unions. Additionally, Walmart's global retail operations have been particularly important uh, for Walmart, representing 25 to 30% of its net sales. Of course, there's much more to the supply chain than just retail, which really marks the end of a long process from production of food and goods to logistics, ports, trucks, and warehouses. While some of the supply chain is unionized, much of it is not, particularly on the production end. Uh, and this contradictory process then involves millions of workers who are amongst the most powerful and who have the highest wages, for example, longshore workers, and millions more whom are the most disenfranchised, some of uh, some of who are enduring slavery-like conditions, like Burmese shrimp farmers in Thailand. My focus today is on Walmart in Chile, particularly the retail and warehouse workers, who have been, in, been winning extraordinary gains under this transnational behemoth. Through this example, we learn that Walmart is, in fact, organizable, though it looks different across the globe and uh, across industries. 
Chilean unions and workers are winning without large bureaucratic infrastructure. These unions do not have legal organizing or research departments. Their dues base is quite small, and most of them only have access to part-time lawyers. What they do have and what they've built uh, from the bottom up is a cadre of committed members. Workers are uh, working creatively to maximize their power under neoliberal labor law. And in this sense, they have turned bad labor law on its head by building these democratic organizations and winning real gains in spite of a system that is fundamentally anti-worker. Political education is imperative for, for building the capacity of these workers, as we'll see. And union democracy is also at the forefront um, and important for building deep levels of commitment and motivation over the long term. So Walmart bought out a firm in Chile called uh, DNS. Um, it's kind of Chilean equivalent in 2009. And upon acquisition, it inherited a chain with four different format stores. The second uh, most important grocery store in the country with over 300 retail stores. Walmart also inherited a number of unions with its acquisition. Um, and instead of renaming a successful brand, Walmart decided to keep these four formats with their names. So Iped Lider is the size of a super Walmart um, and sells food and consumer goods. Lider Express is the size of a Ralph's or a Kroger uh, with food and limited consumer goods. Econo is slightly larger than a 7-Eleven um, and, and sells kind of mostly canned goods and fresh bread, limited produce, and no consumer goods. And Aguenta is the cash and carry store. So Chile makes a good case for study because workers have been successful despite declining union density, a problematic labor code, and the ravaging effects of neoliberalism. For a little context, in 1973, democratically elected socialist Salvador Allende was brutally overthrown by right-wing Augusto Pinochet. A 17-year military dictatorship ensued, ushering in a new era of neoliberalism, which included cutting taxes, trade liberalization, cuts on social spending, the deregulation of banking, and the privatization of healthcare, social security, and education. In 1989, Chile held its first democratic election since the 70s, which was won by the center-left coalition La Concertación. This new era was dubbed neoliberalism with a human face. And in this 29-year period, the right wing has only won two elections, once in 2010 and most recently in 2017, both won by Sebastián Piñera. Overall, the period has been characterized by increased social spending, particularly on health care for the elderly and education, but at the same time has maintained the principal tenets of neoliberalism, expanded trade liberalization, maintenance of banking deregulation, and the privatization of social security. In 2006, we see the first explosion of social movements since the public anti-dictatorship campaigns of the late 80s, and these new social movements began with the high school student walkout in 2006, followed by a labor strike wave in 2009, followed by a nine-month university student walkout demanding free tuition. And I was um, in Chile on a Fulbright doing field work for this project when the university students walked out. I was supposed to be teaching a class. Um, so by 2012, it was clear that politicians had to at least pay lip service to the issue of rights um, and change the national conversation. Nonetheless, winning against Walmart can't simply be chalked up to a better national climate or more successful or robust labor movement as union density remains low and the most important elements of the dictatorship era constitution and labor law remain in effect. Importantly, Walmart has not been kinder, kinder or gentler in Chile. And while it has had to live with unions, it has also constantly pushed the boundaries of labor law. In nearly the decade since it entered the country, it has consistently been on the government's list of corporations that violate labor law. Uh, and it has been particularly egregious in violating human rights and what is known as fundamental rights, which is the right to life and physical integrity, respect, and protection of one's private life, freedom of speech and expression, the right to non-discrimination, the right to organize, uh, and, and perhaps differently from the US context, the right to severance pay. Um, 
So, for example, uh, Walmart kept on Sergio Diaz, dubbed by workers Harry El Sucio, or Dirty Harry, um, as the director of internal security at Walmart Chile. This is a person with a known record of human rights violations, including a conviction on three counts of torture committed during the military dictatorship. Sergio was in charge of intimidating workers who were accused of theft, often using military-like tactics to force confessions. Other examples of Walmart's exploitative behavior include forcing cashiers to wear diapers so that they wouldn't wear, go to the restrooms as much, locking a cashier in the restroom after she demanded a break to use the restroom, and trying to offer workers a better contract if they leave the union, and forcing a queer woman to conform to, quote, normal and appropriate hairstyles for women. These are just a few examples from the workers I interviewed. So it's especially striking that workers, Walmart workers no less, are winning against this transnational giant given the company's history of abuses and the national context that I've just described. Surprisingly, union density in the retail sector is 22%, while union density for the country as a whole is only 14. 80% of Walmart workers are unionized. Many of them belong, uh, belong to pre-existing unions, but many workers uh, have also unionized under Walmart proper. There are 85 different Walmart unions, um, and this is, this is one of the things that's explained by this uh, dictatorship era labor code. Um, Chile does not allow for sectoral bargaining or industry-wide bargaining, so every shop has its own union or multiple unions, um, so that they're constantly competing. And there are five uh, different Walmart retail federations. Uh, one of these is corrupt. Uh, two federations that I worked with were independent, um, not affiliated with the kind of AFL equivalent, the GUT. And two more were created after uh, I left Chile in 2011. And there's also one warehouse union, LTS. So during my time in Chile, I worked with these two independent uh, retail labor federations, the Federación Autónoma and Fenatralid, and the Warehouse Workers Union. Workers in both retail and warehouse have made unprecedented gains under Walmart. So for warehouse workers. Warehouse workers are earning 150% more than what they were earning in 2006, and that is um, adjusting for inflation. Um, they are actually earning more than a lot of the temporary workers in the Inland Empire in the United States. Um, so in addition, they've significantly increased their benefits, including more vacation, a transportation benefit, uh, and perhaps most importantly, a collective versus individual productivity bonus. So winning a collective productivity bonus was particularly important because it undermines competition between workers and optimizes solidarity. Under the old system, individual workers would receive a bonus for producing above 100%, and this, is meant, uh, this meant pushing ahead of co-workers to ensure more pay. Under the new model, the union sets the productivity level, which is in and of itself a huge win, and if they go above it, they all receive the bonus, and they set the productivity level instead of at 100% at 70%. Um, so they're often receiving a productivity bonus. Part of this important work, uh, part of the important work of the union has been to ensure that workers don't act as rate busters. And they have also negotiated release time for their union president, an office inside the warehouse and in downtown Santiago, and the right to post information on bulletin boards. Perhaps most importantly, they've been able to successfully unionize the multi-million dollar DHL subcontracted warehouse that Walmart built in order to undermine LTS. So when Walmart came in, they quickly realized that this was a, a very powerful union and they started building this completely subcontracted other warehouse, gigantic warehouse. And after two years of organizing and millions of dollars in losses for Walmart because the subcontracted workers were not efficiently moving the goods from the warehouse to the supermarkets and the supermarkets were calling and saying, all the glasses are broken, the computers are broken, the television screens are broken. Um, they quickly started having to move production back to the uh, two original uh, warehouses. So most uh, recently, uh, they were just incorporated, these, these 
subcontracted workers were incorporated as full-timers into the LTS union. Retail workers have seen more modest wage increases. They're earning about 30% more than they were earning when they first unionized. Um, and they've also made strides in negotiating productivity bonuses and obtaining paid uniforms. Um, they've been able to somewhat standardize the economic benefits across the four format stores. This is perhaps one of the greatest economic achievements they've had because one of the ways that both DNS and Walmart have pitted workers against each other was to pay the highest wages and the best benefits to workers at IPED LIDER and pay the lowest wages and the fewest benefits to workers at Econo. Uh, and, and so they've been able to standardize some of those things. Okay. Under the old model, uh, so importantly, these workers were able to also break a pattern agreement that was negotiated by the corrupt union. So. When uh, Walmart made its first deal, um, it negotiated a collective bargaining agreement with this kind of corrupt union that essentially said, we won't strike and we won't give you trouble if you just give us like the, the bare minimum. And these independent unions have been able to break that agreement. So retail workers have also had significant symbolic victories. Um, and here I want to make clear that this is not a judgment. I'm not juxtaposing the economic as important and the symbolic as just symbolic. The symbolic victories, I would say, are, are actually more important uh, to the retail workers and to their quality of life on the shop floor than the economic victories have been. But they're different, right? And they're won differently. Uh, so. The symbolic victories have really attacked the heart of Walmart culture. And um, one of the biggest campaigns was on the issue of what Walmart was calling workers. So in the US, Walmart calls workers associates, and it's not a contested uh, category or name. And uh, when Walmart arrived in Chile, they decided to call workers colaboradores, or collaborators. And in the context of a country that had a 17-year-long 17 uh, 17 long military dictatorship, this was a really poor choice of word. Because, of course, collaborator can mean to collaborate, and it can also mean to collaborate with the enemy. And that is exactly how workers took it. Now, interestingly, in Walmart, uh, Mexico, workers are called asociados, which is like associates. And had they come into Chile just calling workers asociados, they probably wouldn't have run into any problems. But instead, they came in with colaborador. <laughs> they didn't do their corporate research, clearly. And so workers were up in arms. You know, many workers were up in arms about this and, uh, and took it to the courts. And, uh, and after a somewhat lengthy battle, a uh, court battle, the judge favored, uh, ruled in favor of workers forcing Walmart to change its handbook and to use the term trabajador or worker instead of colaborador in all legal contracts and communication. This was um, a really important victory because the judge uh, also made clear that what Walmart was trying to do was hide a power relationship, right? That the judge, you know, in, 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 in the court ruling specifically says, there is a power uh, differential between employers and workers, and by calling workers colaboradores, Walmart is attempting to hide that power differential, right? And so then forcing Walmart to change it in all of its official communication uh, with workers was, was quite significant. Walmart has since appealed this three times and has lost every single time. So workers also launched a, a respect at work campaign after a manager tried to fire a queer woman for having a rat tail and a man for having a long beard. Um, they also tried, were harassing this, this other woman who liked to wear all purple. Um, and, uh, and they were forced to, again, workers took these, this to the courts, um, and th they were forced to, Right, and to issue an apology uh, to these workers for, for that. Um, that was printed in the Walmart's monthly newsletter to its workers for a whole year. Um, additionally, workers 
forced the company to allow them to have uh, union meetings inside the stores. So it's important to note that these wins for warehouse and retail workers um, have been achieved in spite of Walmart's bad labor practices. Okay, so to understand how workers are leveraging power successfully, we first need to have a common understanding of power. So what is social power? What does it mean to have social power? Like Piven and Cloward and Jenkins, I argue that social power means the capacity for disruption. Jenkins, for example, argues that oppressed people can only transcend the limitations imposed by elite decision makers when they have the power to force the institutions they are confronting to accept their demands. Yet another kind of power is the power rooted in the cultural and public spheres, what Jennifer Chun calls symbolic leverage. Um, and you know, a prominent example of this is, is you know, the Justice for Janitors campaign that elevated the poor working conditions of janitors to a moral level. This is similarly happen happening in retail. So building on these scholars, I argue that there are two main types of social power, the capacity for symbolic disruption and the capacity for disrupting production. And these are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but sometimes they are. Actions that we traditionally think of in relationship to labor movements, such as strikes, strike threats, direct action, and other strategies aimed at stopping or slowing down production represent the capacity to disrupt production. And symbolic disruption also has the power to coerce employers to acquiesce to workers' demands, but uses this moral element. So not all workers have the same access to these different kinds of disruption. So how do workers obtain social power? Eric Olin Wright defines two types of social power. The first, associational power, is the power that results from the formation of collective organizations of workers, such as political parties and unions. The second, structural power, results simply from the location of workers in an economic system. So while I agree uh, with Wright on the importance of associational and structural power, I argue that these on their own do not produce social power. Rather, they are determinants of social power. It is what workers do with their collective organizations and structural location that ultimately creates power. So strong associational power facilitates um, symbolic disruption and the disruption of production, while structural power most commonly facilitates the disruption of production. So how do workers build strong associational power? Uh, I argue that, uh, that they do this by utilizing uh, strategic capacity, union democracy, and militancy. In his 2010 uh, book, Why David Sometimes Wins, Marshall Gans argues that the United Farm Workers Union was more successful at organizing farm workers than other organizations because they had the ability to devise good strategy what he calls strategic capacity. For GANs, organizations are more likely to develop better strategy when their leaders can access diverse sources of salient information, employ heuristic processes, and demonstrate deep motivation. However, GANs is nearly silent on the question of union democracy. And for the Chilean unions I worked with, democracy was what drove their organization's deep motivation, accountability structures, and deliberative processes. Of course, union democracy is a complicated concept and there are distinct ways of understanding it. So I define it as organizations that are able to bring together formal democracy with high levels of membership participation and member ownership over the strategic decision-making and political processes in their union. A final important component to build a strong associational power is militancy. And by militancy, I mean confrontational, disruptive, direct action tactics that workers in their organizations use to coerce employers to meet their demands. Taken together, strategic capacity, union democracy, and militancy help build strong organizations and therefore strong associational power. As a result, these organizations have a stronger capacity for symbolic disruption or the disruption of production, allowing them to win better rights. Additionally, in the case of Chile, autonomy from the state and political parties has given the organizations I worked with more freedom to think outside the box. And here's a, a visual uh, representation of what I just described. So you have winning rights, and then you have the capacity uh, 
for symbolic disruption and the capacity for disrupting production. Um, associational, strong associational power feeds into that. A, a strong associational power also feeds into their structural power. Uh, and you have strategic capacity, union, democracy, and militancy feeding into um, strong associational power. And then autonomy. So what does this look like in Chile? I argue that while both workers in the warehouse industry and workers in retail have had success in negotiating with Walmart, they have approached the transnational giant differently based on the kinds of power they can most effectively leverage. The warehouse union is characterized by what I call strategic democracy, and the two retail federations are characterized by what I call flexible militancy. Uh, so the warehouse union, again, it's three warehouses, it's 3,000 workers, predominantly men. Uh, and the initial organizing committee uh, was comprised of people who had strong anti-dictatorship organizing experience and or came from trade union families and had a fair amount of political consciousness. The main characteristics of strategic democracy include a strong democratic tradition, political education, and strategic capacity. The organization had high levels of militancy initially and through its second contract. However, they haven't participated in militant actions since their second contract, largely because they've been able to achieve their goals without it. Its formal union structure includes 11 membership committees, including a women's committee, health and safety, newsletter, organizing, education, and a soccer team. That's the most important committee. <laughs> and the leadership is elected to three-year terms with midterm uh, membership vote to assess confidence in the leadership. Uh, membership meetings called assembleas, and um, sorry that the iPhone of 2011 was, did not have a great camera you know, situation. Um, so uh, these assembleas are held every three months and uh, always have at least 80% attendance. They're held on Sundays from 9 to 12. So it's particularly impressive that they have 80% attendance. And uh, the union has to rent a theater uh, to, you know, to be able to have these meetings because so many people come. Uh, and it's union members and their families. The, meeting, the meetings begin with a cultural performance. Um, the two that I attended featured Mapuche dances. The Mapuches are the, uh, the indigenous uh, groups of Chile. And uh, so the, the dances were led by workers themselves and linked the struggles between Chile's indigenous population and Chilean workers. Uh, this was followed by a welcome from the president and union business. And the meetings um, are very participatory. Uh, and the assemblas function as the highest decision-making body uh, of the union. So there's vigorous debate on each agenda item. As LTS President uh, Rodrigo Villagra says, quote, if you involve people, if you create a project with them, people feel motivated. When decisions are made collectively, the responsibility for those decisions belong to the collective and not only to the union leadership. This is what's different. A bad collective decision is a bad decision by all which is different from a bad decision made by the union leadership, which is only the decision of a few. At the Assemblea in the previous picture, workers were voting on whether a retroactive pay they won in a lawsuit should be redistributed to the membership as a whole, or whether it should only go to 100 workers named in the lawsuit. The mic was passed around for an hour and a half with workers actively participating in the dialogue, the leadership facilitated the discussion, but mostly did not intervene in the dialogue, specifically not wanting to influence outcome. In the end, workers overwhelmingly decided to redistribute the back pay to the membership as a whole, thereby increasing solidarity and collective trust. Political education is woven into the fabric of this union. In addition to setting up structures in the union to facilitate dialogue, debate, and participation, the union has invested significant resources into leadership development for workers through the Escuela Sindical, or the union school. Members of the union are required to participate in the Escuela's 10-week program at least once, and these leadership workshops cover issues such as labor legislation, labor and working class history, workplace rights, the labor code, and mapping production. 
They believe participation in the Escuela Sindical will create greater levels of class consciousness and union participation in general. And um, as of January, over 2,500 workers have been through this escuela, and it's yielded incredible results. So after completing the program, Esteban Ashraf Stewart said, quote, in all my years in school, I never learned my own history, the history of the working class. The Escuela Sindical has given me the opportunity to see the world differently, realize our own potential as the working class of this country. But not only am I understanding our power, I also now understand how bosses think and act. I feel empowered to make change for myself, my coworkers, for my family, and for future generations. One of the most important concepts that workers learn in the Escuela Sindical is Gramsci's notion of controlling production. Um, Gramsci, compelled by the worker struggles in Turin, believed that worker councils inside of factories had true revolutionary potential because these democratic forms would give workers control over the productive process. Gramsci argues, quote, the existence of the council gives workers the direct responsibility of production. It draws them to improving the work, instills a conscious and voluntary discipline, creates the psychology of the producer, of the creator of history, end quote. The union leadership has taken this concept of controlling production very seriously, and in the Escuela Sindical, they jointly create knowledge with union members about the productive process in the warehouse. Historically, workers were often cheated by DNS and then by Walmart because they didn't understand how their productivity bonuses were being calculated. David says, the bonus system is so confusing. It was never clear what our paycheck was supposed to be, and so the employer stole from us. But now we understand the, uh, product, the productive flows and our work, and they don't get away with stealing our wages, even though they try. As part of their training in the Escuela Sindical, workers learn how to map their workplace. This includes understanding the layout of the warehouse, who works in each section, strategic places for disruption inside the warehouse, the flow of goods to and from the warehouse, and worker output. Union members collect all this information about the warehouse, including data stored on computers, and this gives the union greater capacity to set minimum ranges for productivity bonuses and a better understanding of strategic points where they can disrupt production. Walking through the shop floor is particularly impressive to see members involved in the daily work of the union. Workers control this warehouse. When management questioned my presence, workers simply said, She's been invited by the union, and they let me in with no further questions. In addition to the bustling shop floor, workers were busy in the union office pulling together a newsletter, helping others file grievances, and adding information to bulletin boards. So democracy and uh, political education directly fuel the union's strategic capacity, allowing them to take advantage of strategic moments. During their second contract negotiations, LTS workers learned that Walmart was interested in buying a majority share of the company um, from an email they found in the computer system and um, they used to look for flows of productivity. They were able to leverage this information and influence the strategic decision making of the bargaining team in order to secure an unprecedented contract. So moving on to the retail unions, uh, which I call flexible militancy, so again, there are five uh, retail federations, 80, 85 different unions. Um, uh, three of these are progressive type organizations, and I worked with two. Retail uh, workers uh, are slightly more women, uh, many middle-aged, but increasingly a lot of young people. A lot of the women have come out of domestic work. Um, most did not have labor experience, though some did have some uh, anti-dictatorship organizing experience. And the leaders of the two federations I worked with were uh, women, including a queer woman. Like the warehouse unions, uh, the retail unions also have strategic capacity and union democracy, but their political histories, leverage, and workplace issues have allowed the independent retail unions to construct a different kind of organizational culture. These two federations also credit their autonomy with the opportunity to devise strategies that might be frowned upon by the GUT or regional confederations. So these uh, unions are much more responsive to the shop floor. Uh, they tend to be more militant in their tactics. They use a lot of direct action, have formal democratic structures, 
but less widespread membership participation and, and political education. Nonetheless, they have a high level of strategic capacity. The predominant issues we see them organizing around have to do with anti-union practices and violations of fundamental rights. And um, they have had you know, many, many symbolic victories. So in addition, um, uh, they, they were able to uh, break this pattern agreement, which, which Walmart had previously negotiated, and it's a big source of pride. Sandra states, as union president, I am most proud of the fact that we were able to negotiate the pattern agreement. This agreement only required Walmart to abide by the most basic labor law, but did not grant any real power or benefits to workers. Because of the careful organizing we have done, we have secured real rights and benefits. Most importantly, we can show the other unions what grassroots unionism can accomplish. While these unions don't have a lot of structural power, uh, they have used their power in creative ways. For example, holding uh, meetings uh, in front of Walmart stores. So when, when Walmart denied uh, workers the opportunity to meet inside the stores, which is something actually guaranteed by labor law, uh, workers decided to hold their meetings right in front of the store with, you know, their their bullhorn like connected to the power source inside the store. Um, and it didn't take long before Walmart decided to let them meet inside the stores. <laughs> About two weeks. Um, here's another one of them standing outside stores saying Walmart shows its claws, you know, <laughs> against against its workers. Uh, they also, retail workers also walked off the job to protest changes in the cafeteria food. Adriana states, before Walmart, when we worked full shifts, we used to get a morning snack like a piece of fruit and milk or coffee, and then we would get to lunch, and then we would get lunch, a real lunch, like an appetizer, hot plate, dessert, and drink. When Walmart came in, they contracted with Sodexo, and they thought they could serve us gringo food, a cold sandwich and a piece of fruit. We weren't having it. We walked out and demanded that they treat us with respect. And you know what? The next week, they were serving hot meals again. They also brought uh, mariachis on Mother's Day uh, to protest the abuse of women. Erika says, you should have seen their faces when they saw us marching with, with mariachis. The managers looked like they were going to explode. They were furious, but they just have to deal with us. So using legal strategies and uh, uh, they, they use legal strategies and delegations to eliminate Walmart's use of colaboradores. Sandra uh, says a lot of workers were outraged from the outset about being called colaboradores, but other workers didn't think it was such a big deal. It was an important moment for our union to do some political education, talk to the compañeros about Walmart culture and what it means. In the end, we got most workers on board because they came to realize how insidious it was. And Daniela states, by being active in the union, I've learned that the employer is not on our side, but neither is the law. We have to be creative, think outside the box, captivate the imagination of the public. We have different experiences that we're bringing to the table. That is what makes this a grassroots union, a union with real power. These actions show the multifaceted tactics and strategies that retail workers are using to confront the boss. They are working creatively to turn bad labor law into an organizing opportunity. And while it is clear that shop floor level unionism uh, or enterprise unionism has hurt the labor movement on a macro level as it causes fragmentation, uh, in the case of these independent union federations, it has had some unintended consequences. First, it has made it easy for workers to unionize because they only need 10% of the members in their shop to sign union cards before registering the union. It's just kind of, if you get your 10%, the union is certified, right? So that is one big difference with the US. Um, however, negotiating a contract is, is very, very similar to the, to the United States. So the, once these workers have a union, then it could take four or five years before they're able to negotiate their first contract. Um, because while the barrier for entry is low, uh, the barrier to actually securing a, a real contract is high. Second, scale matters. Uh, because the shops are small, between 10 and 350 workers across four format stores and retail, these unions have been able to build more democratic organizations. 
particularly because these independent unions have been able to challenge other corrupt company unions within the same store. So they're kind of organizing and, uh, you know, kind of pushing members out of the less good unions into their unions. They're, you know, they're constantly in this war on two fronts, the war against these corrupt unions in their, in their workplaces and also the war against Walmart. So, um, again, while having multiple unions in a store serves uh, to weaken worker power overall, in this case, it has helped these unions build effective organizations. Um, through this process of intensive one-on-one -on -one organizing, these unions are increasing their membership and therefore their power within Walmart. Additionally, these unions have some significant symbolic leverage. While warehouse workers tend to be hidden, these workers are public. They use their power to organize and educate consumers, Ramon states. When we were denied the right to have our meetings in the store, we were angry. So we thought about what we could do to embarrass Walmart. And then Rodrigo said, why don't we hold our meetings outside at peak times when customers are shopping? That way we can embarrass Walmart, but also educate consumers about our struggles. So they have also uh, begun the process of mapping their workplace because they have met up with the warehouse union and they've been working with the warehouse union. Um, and some of the retail workers are going to the Escuela Sindical. Um, and so they're figuring out which jobs within retail stores have more strategic power. So Sandra says, we have learned from our comrades in the warehouse and figured out that in retail, we don't have a lot of structural power as a whole. But then we started thinking about the different areas within stores and realized that some jobs have more structural power than others. For example, we can create a real bottleneck if cashiers walk off the job. So in conclusion, uh, Chilean workers are winning against Walmart because they've created dynamic militant democratic organizations that leverage power differently. Through a process of worker education, leaders' political experience, structural location in the economy, and creatively using legal strategies, workers have been increasing their dignity, benefits, and wages. Warehouse workers have done this by employing an organizational structure I call strategic democracy, which allows them to maximize their structural power, having first built strong associational power. In their, 2000, their 2006 strike was so effective and their organization so powerful that Walmart has not wanted to test this union again, and instead they continue to win progressively better contracts. Retail workers, on the other hand, have won using flexible militancy. Their public face, responsiveness to the shop floor, militancy and democratic form have allowed them to employ both symbolic disruption and disruption of production. As a result, they have successfully attacked Walmart culture forced the company to publicly apologize and broken the pattern agreement. So lessons from Chile and the amazing research we have heard uh, about throughout this conference gives us hope for the future. The supply chain under global capitalism provides fertile ground for organizing and empowering workers. But I caution us as scholars and activists to not only privilege workers with structural power, those who seem most able to win, we need to think about the supply chain more organically, analyzing and organizing across industry and structural location. Thank you. Okay. And Deb, uh, are you ready? We're ready to go. Okay, let me, uh, I can hear you, but, uh, let me see if I can hear you again in one second. Uh, say something. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. Let's um, uh, full screen this. So you're now a giant uh, face. Thank you. Please. Ready? Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, hi, I'm looking at myself, which is a bit odd. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Colette and Matt for inviting me to be with you today virtually. Um, I also want to thank uh, Carlisa Robinson for assisting with the logistics of this conversation about logistics. I want to thank you all for sharing virtual space with me today. I'm really honored to follow such an extraordinary program of speakers and especially grateful to Carolina for her beautiful talk. I'm sad also to miss everything that preceded this session. 
uh, the chance to meet some of you in person and the chance to see those of you that I know and love already. Um, so last year when Colette and Matt invited me to be part of this amazing event, a large group of us had just come off a tent but by the boycott of our association's annual meeting. In the immediate aftermath of the Trump election and with the immigration ban in full swing, hundreds of geographers came together and made a set of demands for a change. These ranged from demanding that the Association of American Geographers directly challenge the immigration ban and support sanctuary efforts for impacted scholars, to demanding that uh, the association's divestment from financial institutions funding the Dakota Access Pipeline. Many of us organized alternative events to the annual conference in our hometown. In Toronto, we had a day-long mini-conference with about 75 local scholars and organizers from worker centers, indigenous land protectors, um, and Black Lives Matter. Our efforts had some impact and led to productive dialogue on a number of issues. So um, at the time of my invitation, um, they planned well in advance, or just with logic systems. I thanked Colette and Matt deeply for their invitation to New York, but indicated that I wasn't going to be traveling to the U.S. for academic work for a while. They graciously offered this alternative mode of participation. So now I'm fully aware that these academic boycotts have fizzled and to have a discernible impact or audibility, such an action needs to be collective. Uh, no doubt it would have to come from something much bigger and more significant than just me. But that moment also afforded me an opportunity for more deliberate reflection on the role, I'm sorry, on the rote practice of academic mobility. Beyond questioning the privilege of circulation and the crisis of carbon, I also reflected on the cost of routine absence for the people, projects, and places to which and to whom I am responsible. I sustained my decision not to travel, despite the seemingly ridiculous boycott of one, in the spirit of all of this. As I think through questions of infrastructure, circulation, scale, and futurity in my current research, I must also work through the ethical and political dimensions of these questions in my everyday life. So all this is just to say that I'm sorry to miss the chance for more intimate dialogue and casual conversation, but my decision didn't come lightly. So today, um, I, was, well, I was actually going to um, build on some of the conversation about Walmart um, in my response to Professor Nunez's talk, um, which I was fortunate to read in advance. But there's some urgent things going on up here north of the medicine line, and I decided instead what I'm going to do is sort of take a circuitous response, um, woven through some of these um, unfolding crises up here, um, but also through some of my current work. So this crisis that I'm referring to is very much a crisis of logistics, and while it may sound and look very different uh, from the struggles that Professor Nunez has shared with us, there are some, I think, deeply important connections that I hope will be generative for us to think through. So in the struggle for Walmart uh, workers' rights and worker power that she's engaged, and in the struggles over colonial infrastructure that I'm going to discuss, questions of disruption hover centrally. In both contexts, the struggles are also led by women in seemingly peripheral spaces fighting against American logistical corporate behemoths, and from two of the largest sectors of supply chain capitalism, so in her case retail, in my case energy. So I'm hoping that the outright colonial context of the cases I'm going to explore, or the case I explore, might complement Professor Munoz's investigation. As different as they may appear, I think together they allow us to see common and distinct challenges in contemporary struggle over supply and command. So I'm going to switch now to some slides that I, um, I'm going to share with you. And how do I do that? First, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So I'm calling my um, little intervention today the jurisdiction of infrastructure. So it's only three years after Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, and the first year after the Settler State 150th anniversary celebration. The Truth and Reconciliation Report, or I'm going to call it just the TRT, was marked by moral and political claims to repair relations between Canada and Indigenous people, and by formal and popular commitments to redress the violence perpetrated by the Settler State. In 2015, live broadcasts of the Commission's reporting described the years of work invested in archiving stories from thousands of survivors of Canada's residential school system, a system that has a mandate of uh, killing the Indian in the child. It was not the benevolence of the state but the extraordinary resilience of those survivors in their class action lawsuit that brought the Commission into existence. 
while the Canadian state had to be dragged into this process, 2015 was nevertheless a moment of possibility for change. Beyond official state commitments to reconciliation, institutions of all kinds made promises to take up the PRC's call to action. Artistic, academic, health, and cultural institutions began articulating programmatic responses, and Canadians were invited to take responsibility beyond formal and legislative action. Just two years later, that sentiment of possibility withered. Canada 150, ostensibly a moment to mark history, was instead defined by enforced amnesia. Festivities were awash with the language of reconciliation, but sidelined both historic and ongoing state violence, not least the very act of celebrating so-called replacement of multiple indigenous jurisdictions with a single colonial one. As the late Chouetma leader, Art Manuel, made clear, I do not wish to celebrate Canada stealing our land. That is what Canadians will be celebrating on July 1st, the theft of 99.8% of our land, leaving us on reserves that make up only 0.2% of the territories given to us by the Creator. Millions of dollars were spent on the 150 balloons and birthday parties in a gaudy and ghastly celebration of the birth of a colonial formation which had its genesis in genocide. Between these two moments, these two years, lie promises and practices. Promises of change and renewal collide with practices that reproduce the very colonial relations which all those promises were meant to undermine. What has fatally fractured hope in this moment is arguably infrastructure. Indigenous people organized against the 150 birthday celebrations, insisting that struggles over pipelines, dams, and drinking water offered a better diagnosis of nation-to-nation -nation relations. Drawing attention to the infrastructure that underpins contemporary settler colonialism, water and land protectors expose ties that are long and bind tight. As Wilt writes, the quote, massive uh, 150 celebrations of July 1st are finally over, leaving little in their wake but hangovers, a multi-million dollar price tag, and mountains of trash. But for some indigenous peoples in Canada, the festivities remain a visceral reminder of their continued dispossession from ancestral lands and waters. That's especially true for those on the front lines of mega projects, pipelines, hydro, dams, oil and gas wells, liquefied natural gas terminals, and mines that infringe on indigenous land rights." End quote. Struggles over energy and extractive infrastructures have been fierce across national states in recent years, from the Muskrat Falls and Site C dams to the Ring of Fire extractive zone, and especially today, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. As water and land protectors are hauled off by security forces from protest sites, we cannot forget the ways in which these infrastructures are always entangled with legal ones. Legal and carceral systems have indeed been at the center of anti-colonial struggle for the ways they disproportionately cage indigenous people and systematically exonerate those who kill them, as with the recent murder cases of Colton Bushi and Tina Fontaine. And yet, law is, is much more than a question of over-representation over in courts and prisons and even cemeteries. It's more than a question of the racialized application of enforcement of a legal system. It's through the claim of juris to jurisdiction that settler states attempt to replace established indigenous legal systems and sovereignties with their own, as Jerry Pasternak has argued. Jurisdiction is the authority to have authority over a particular territory, but jurisdiction is actualized through material infrastructures. In other words, historically and in the present, the construction of railroads, dams, roads, and pipelines relied upon the settler state claim to jurisdiction, but that jurisdiction is also materialized through infrastructure. Infrastructure has long been essential to the making of settler states, but national states are also a means to achieve infrastructural ends. Oops, and that, um, this is just a, a, an image from the Treaty Alliance Against Tar Sands Expansion, which is an alliance between over 100 First Nations um, in Canada and beyond, and you can see that sort of Xing out of pipelines that uh, have had successful struggles mounted against them, and the ones that are still remaining that also have successful struggles um, currently. So the Trans Mountain Pipeline, oh, sorry. Um, today in April 2018, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau fights tirelessly to assert national jurisdiction in order to see a planned pipeline to completion. In the face of extraordinary indigenous resistance to Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain Pipe Project, and uh, Kinder Morgan is um, the largest infrastructure company in North America. It has over 85,000 miles of pipe 
And so I think there's some interesting parallels between the size and scale of this American corporation um, set aside, set next to something like Walmart. So in the face of extraordinary indigenous resistance to Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain Pot Project, and without a trace of the tears that fell for reconciliation, Trudeau asserts over and over that this infrastructure is in the national interest and, quote, it will get built. The Trans Mountain Pipeline struggle, built by some as Canada's standing rock, has been simmering for some time. Approved in 2016, Trans Mountain involves a $7.4 billion investment in a new 980-kilometer pipeline parallel to an old existing one, almost tripling the capacity for oil companies to ship up to 890,000 barrels of oil per day from Alberta to the west coast of British Columbia. The project has been contested since it was first proposed. Indigenous resistance has been fierce and creative with legal and direct actions by people along the path of the pipeline and across the continent. The Shoetma nations are a particularly significant force with more than half the length of the pipeline planned to run through their unceded territory. The Shoetma Women's Warrior Society has pledged to stop any trans mountain development on their land. Two British Columbia municipalities in the province of British Columbia itself have taken formal legal action while environmental students and other social movements uh, have all mounted direct actions and other kinds of challenges, including um, the formal court challenges. An extraordinary drama has been unfolding in the struggle between British Columbia's efforts to block the pipeline and Alberta's commitments to see it built, involving fiery rhetoric, threats of interprovincial boycotts, and calls from Alberta's premier for the federal government to forcefully assert its jurisdiction. And as of today, there's talk about um, uh, uh, martial um, and security um, enforcement. On April 8, 2018, in the face of all this, Kinder Morgan just declared that it would withdraw all non-essential work, giving Ottawa just seven weeks to ensure the security of the project. The government and mainstream media have not stopped talking about the jurisdictional struggle between provincial and federal governments. They frame the building crisis as a struggle over provincial and federal jurisdiction and hardly mention what is without a doubt the larger jurisdictional question between the settler states and indigenous nations whose territories underlie the pipeline's path. Canada asserts jurisdiction over national infrastructure, but lands in question were never ceded and are governed by multiple indigenous jurisdictions. So Sherry Pasternak outlines how in the context of Canadian legal history, Quote, indigenous peoples, much like firearms and motor vehicle registrations, have been gradually transformed into objects of jurisdiction rather than subjects in nation-to-nation -nation relationships. Pasternak follows Audrey Simpson and others who interrogate the space of overlapping jurisdiction, where the settler state attempts to impose legal authority upon established indigenous borders. Jurisdiction is thus a key in the structure of settler colonialism, and as Pasternak insists, Quote, to engage in the question of what it means to decolonize law, we must, we must ask by what authority a law has the authority to be invoked and to govern. The mainstream account of the jurisdictional struggle at play with the Trans Mountain Pipeline already assumes that the settler state holds a monopoly on jurisdiction, but it does not account for the foundations of this authority. By making the Trans Mountain question one of exclusive federal jurisdiction, what is allied is not only the authority of authority, but also the work of infrastructure in materializing self-proclaimed jurisdiction. The story of a singular settler jurisdiction and a single jurisdictional struggle that unfolds within the settler state is thoroughly inadequate. Yet it's also revealing that in that it takes us back to the constitution of the Canadian state 150 years ago and the time of confederation when these links between infrastructure, jurisdiction, and settler colonialism were forged. In 1867, the so-called Fathers of Confederation gathered to sign a document which was understood to birth the Dominion of Canada, but the labor was slow as this constitution relied on infrastructure to be actualized. In his classic work, The Canadian, Stanley insists, quote, bonds of steel as well as, as well as of sentiment were needed to hold the new confederation together. Without railways, there would be and could be no Canada. Indeed, this massive, sorry, this infrastructure literally, materially made the Canadian state possible. But in a seemingly circular move, it was also the Constitution that provided the federal government's jurisdiction in the making of national infrastructure. Delegates from the provinces of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick 
made the construction of intercolonial, the intercolonial rail a condition of their entry into confederation in Section 10 of the Constitution. It's explicit, explaining that, quote, in order to give effect to the agreement, the rail must be complete with all practicable speed. Section 92 of the Constitution also specifically asserts national jurisdiction over, quote, lines of schemes or other ships, railways, roads, telegraphs, or other works and undertakings connecting the province with any other or other provinces or extending beyond the limits of the province. While Section 92 extends to such works as, although wholly situated within the province, are before or after their execution declared by the Parliament of Canada to be for the general advantage of Canada. So four years after the initial signatory, British Columbia joined confederation, again on the condition of the construction of a national rail infrastructure. Because British Columbia's signing of the Constitution was contingent on the completion of the Canadian Pacific Railroad, the genesis of a settler state that spans coast to coast was only realized by that same infrastructure that was sanctioned by the Constitution. So then, like now, infrastructure was at the center of violent relations of rule, materializing settler colonial jurisdiction. The Canadian Pacific Railroad was famously referred to as the, quote, spine of the nation, but it was built through colonial dispossession, hyper-exploited, racialized labor, and the circulation of finance from the transatlantic slave trade into the iron track. By turning to a particular stretch of the track, we can see how infrastructure assembles settler jurisdiction as it violently trespasses indigenous jurisdiction. So in 1885, a different group of white men gathered to drive the last flight into Canadian confederation. They gathered on the unceded territory of the Chihuahua people and staged the famous ceremony announcing the completion of the Canadian Pacific Railroad at Craigalaki. These engineers of confederation worked in iron instead of ink, and to this day a small flat marks the site. Yet it's less than 50 kilometers down the track at uh, the Revelstoke stop where we might linger for a, for a fuller picture of the price of this national infrastructure. Like Kaigalaki, Revelstoke is also built on the unceded territory of the Chihuahua people, the very same people who are vocally and creatively defending land and water in the current struggle against the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Revelstoke tends to conjure images of sea floats and luxury lodges, as today the town is a famous alpine resort. Yet behind the name is a larger and gruesome story of distinct importance. The town was named after Edward Baring, first Baron Revelstoke, that first Baron Revelstoke in honor of his role securing the crucial funding for the Canadian Pacific Railroad with his family, Baring's Bank. The scale and reach of the bank was extraordinary. Baring literally financed empires. London's oldest merchant bank, Baring's wealth, was derived largely from material funder and the transatlantic slave trade. The Barings were active in the East India Company and the Caribbean slave trade. They were key in financing counter-revolutionary efforts in Haiti. They financed um, the Louisiana Purchase, which further dispossessed indigenous people on Turtle Island, and opened large lands to the American plantation system. After the British criminalized the, slave, the trade in enslaved human beings, Barings moved to, in, to finance large sections of the U.S. cotton plantation system, becoming the largest importer of cotton in the 1840s. While the Barings are commemorated in the naming of this alpine town, it's on the same treacherous stretch of the rail that more than 700 Chinese laborers died in obscurity. Railway builders in Canada, verging on bankruptcy and facing delay, borrowed labor recruitment and management strategies from the United States and brought as many as 17,000 Chinese laborers to Canada between 1881 and 1884 to build these the most dangerous sections of the rail. They were paid a fraction of the wages of white workers, purchased their own gear and provisioned themselves in work camps, and dealt with extreme forms of racism from white workers and the, the public more broadly. Immediately after the completion of the railroad in 1885, Canada imposed a head tax on Chinese immigrants, initially set at $50 a person. The tax was later raised to $500 uh, before Chinese immigration was banned altogether. So through Revelstoke, so many local and transnational threads of imperial violence are interwoven. But of course, it's not just here that national infrastructure did the work of dispossession. To the east in the central plains, indigenous peoples were deliberately starved to death or submission in order to clear the plains for the building of the rail, as James Dashik has detailed. 
on both sides of the medicine line, the encroaching railroad served as the rationale and the means for genocide to the mass slaughter of the bison. It was also in the prairies that the Canadian Pacific Railroad received an enormous land grant and entered the field of colonial, field of colonial real estate agents, actively recruiting settlers, building model settlements and irrigation systems, and selling land under the auspices of the Canadian Pacific Railroad's Department of Colonization. With each stretch of the track from coast to coast, the horrors accumulate. It is on these same Chihuahua lands today where struggles over settler colonial infrastructure and jurisdiction unfold. In the contemporary struggle over the pipeline, as with the historical imposition of the rail, Canada's claim to jurisdiction is founded on colonial replacement enacted through infrastructure. One of the most visible and creative efforts to stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline unfolds in the Shawetma Tiny House Warriors Our Land is Home project. And I think, um, you know, I'd really love to talk more maybe in the discussion uh, period um, about the question of gender um, in both of our talks and the role of women in these, um, these, these, these movements. I think that even just the question of home itself as, as um, a, a, an act and space in um, this, this action is, is really fascinating. So here warriors are constructing tiny houses and placing them along the pipeline route on their territory to quote, assert Shawetma's law and jurisdiction and block access to this pipeline. Initiatives like this build on long histories of creative anti-colonial organizing on this very same territory. With the struggle against the Trans Mountain Pipeline, we see precisely the refusal of settler colonial infrastructures but also the refusal of settler colonial claims to jurisdiction. Indeed, historical struggles over rail and contemporary struggles over pipelines both suggest that infrastructure and jurisdiction are deeply entangled in the making of settler colonialism. The, the Canadian Pacific Railroad was a condition of possibility for national jurisdiction in that without the rail, confederation would have been dissolved. But so too, the railroad required national jurisdiction that was granted by the Constitution. So today it would seem as though jurisdiction is a condition of possibility for the pipeline, while the pipeline itself would enact the separate state self-proclaimed jurisdiction. So there's only one way out of this crisis of Canada's line to honor its commitments to reconciliation, to treaties, and to the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And um, this must start with honoring the jurisdiction of sovereign peoples. The outstanding question, as Anishinaabe legal scholar John Burroughs articulates so well, is not about where we have been, but about where whether the future will be different. So infrastructure underpins that our colonialism literally and material make, literally and materially making Canada a decolonial response might begin by asking what infrastructures can take us beyond 150. Thank you very much.